Thank you for that kind introduction, Thierry. It's a really a pleasure to be back here at Cornell to receive this invitation uh, to uh, present at this uh, seminar, seminar series. And so uh, this, uh, this presentation I'm going to do today is informed by, uh, I guess, a personal interest of mine. As uh, Terry said, I lived and worked in the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, for many years, a country that's unfortunately had its challenges with conflict. And then I, I've also conducted research in Central Africa, which is unfortunately several of the countries there are also affected by conflict. And so, so my presentation today is kind of bringing that perspective into uh, trying to understand how does climate change intersect with, uh, with, con uh, with conflict. So is, my, is, uh, is that okay in terms of the sound? Okay, because it sounds odd to, to me. <laughs> so there's of course uh, been a lot in the news uh, and you know, journalists have discussed, uh, academics have discussed, you know, what is that connection between climate change and conflict? And certainly the United Nations has been discussing this for a number of years. Uh, the former Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, uh, made this statement back in 2011 that the facts are clear, climate change is real, and it not only exacerbates threats to international peace and security, it is uh, a threat to international peace and security. And the United, States, the United States Department of Defense has labeled climate change as a threat multiplier. They say the pressures uh, caused by climate change are going to influence resource competition, which is going to place additional burdens on economies, societies, and governance institutions around the world. That's going to just worsen conditions, leading to more terrorist activity and other forms of violence. And then most recently, in uh, January of this year, the Security Council met again, echoing that perspective of the Pentagon on climate change as a threat multiplier, but also recognizing the complexity that it's going to maybe exacerbate existing vulnerabilities that are there and that may uh, intensify the impact um, and the length of the conflict. And so the way it's often assumed is that because of this uh, excessive greenhouse gas emissions, which is causing climate change, uh, this is going to lead to localized environmental change, which is going to then lead to uh, shortages of land and food, which will lead to competition over those resources, resulting in localized conflict, which can then lead to uh, challenges to the state or other governance institutions and more widespread conflict. So is there any research that actually has documented this uh, you know, assumed direct connection? So in northwestern Kenya, uh, there, is, there is increasing temperatures, increasing variable rainfall, and this, of course, has had an impact on the reliability of pastoral and water resources for pastoral people. There's always been cyclical drought in that part of Kenya, but now there are changes happening. So Kenya is not a, a, a fragile state, but in the northwestern part, the government hasn't always been able to provide the necessities of the population. And so, and so the mobility of pastoralists is also restricted by not only Kenya, but also the neighboring country of Uganda. And so there is a high vulnerability and in human insecurity uh, you know, for scarcity of food. And so this has sometimes motivated pastoral groups to use force in order to be able to gain uh, land and water resources uh, for their cattle. So, so this does seem to be a, a, a localized connection between resource scarcity and conflict. So beyond those localized examples, is there anything to address it at a global scale? So the first uh, uh, demonstration of this was published in a paper in Nature in 2011, uh, where they, uh, they examined data from 1950 to 2004, looking at increasing conflict in relationship to the extremes of the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which of course, as you know, influences the tropics during El Nino years. The tropics are warmer and drier, uh, and the mid-latitudes mid don't have the same effect. And so based on their calculations and their modeling, they found that the probability of new civil conflicts that arose in the tropics, you know, tracked to be more in the El Nino years in, in uh, comparison to the, to the La Nina years. And so 
So they concluded in this paper that it may have had a role in about 21% of those conflicts and, and have you know, therefore made that statement that, that this was the first incident actually demonstrating that connection between the stability of modern society being connected to the global climate. They've since gone on and done another study that was published in uh, 2014, and this one was more of a meta-analysis where they looked at over 50 publications and they found strong support for a causal association across different geographies, time periods, spatial scales, climatic events and of different duration. So this, you know, does seem to be some evidence. Uh, in the IPCC report in 2014 was the first time in which they actually included human insecurity in its review of how global warming will be experienced around the world. And it lists outcomes such as, you know, displacement of people, food shortages, economic shocks. And the, uh, the uh, head of the, the chairman of the IPCC made this comment at the time that if the world doesn't do anything about mitigating the emissions of greenhouse gases, um, then the very social stability of human systems could be at stake, which is a pretty dramatic statement to make. Now others are less uh, certain about this uh, simplistic direct link between climate change and conflict. Uh, some people out, you know, outright reject you know, what they see as a neo-Malthusian Malthusian narrative about resource crunches and climate change and, and environmental conflict. And they also see that, it's, that it leads maybe to the disempowerment of, of the very people who perhaps are, are blamed for these uh, so-called tragedies of the commons. And so, the, uh, in the World Bank report on the implications of climate change for global armed conflict, uh, they summarize the perspective of, of this group of people that don't see a simplistic causal link, that it's not necessarily going to lead to elevated uh, uh, conflict uh, as a result of climate change, and that it's going to be a lot of complexity in that interaction between, uh, you know, organized violence, very country and context, specific. So it seems to refer back to that complexities of that Kenyan example. And there's similar examples in other, in, other er, in other arid countries where increasing drought and increasing temperature in, in combination with other factors is leading to violence. So there was a study in uh, the Journal of Peace Research that again echoed this uh, uncertainty about this simplistic causal link. And so, you know, they put more, much more emphasis on economic and political variables that are really the most, uh, the most important predictors of whether or not conflict is going to, uh, to emerge in a certain area, less on actual climate change. And so their recommendation was keeping the focus on societal development and building resilience uh, for, for people who may experience climate change. So, in this presentation, I, I want to go beyond just that discussion of does, uh, you know, does climate change actually uh, cause conflict? Because what I think is more important to focus on is that we, as a world, are experiencing a changing climate. And so how are those realities going to be experienced by those people who live in situations that are affected by conflict? In, uh, you know, where there's situations of inter-ethnic conflict or in what are often called fragile states. How are people going to adapt to climate change and how is climate change just going to make their lives that much more complex? And so that's why I've titled my talk Another Perspective on Climate Change and Conflict and focusing on two countries in, in Central Africa. So fragile states are those states that are often considered considered to be dysfunctional in that they have weak governance institutions, they are often uh, widespread poverty, often there is not, the government does not actually, is not in complete control of, of the territory that actually is supposed to be part of the particular country, and so there often is a high propensity to conflict and violence. And so the OECD report on states of fragility in 2018, unfortunately, uh, listed 27 countries that are considered to be chronically uh, fragile in the world and 18 of those are in Africa. So as I said I'm going to focus on Central Africa 
uh, the Congo Basin Forest, which is uh, the second largest contigu contiguous rainforest in the world, covers six countries in Central Africa. And I'm going to focus on, and I've been doing some research in the countries of Cameroon, Central African Republic, and the Democratic Republic of Congo for a few years. Uh, but I'm just going to focus on CAR and DRC today for the context of this talk. So the Central African Republic and the DRC are countries that are rich in many different resources, not just forest resources, but also minerals, also uh, you know, agriculture, agricultural products. Uh, both countries have, in spite of being rich, uh, rank very low on the Human Development Index. Uh, and they have, uh, people are not very well off in either of these countries. And both of these countries have e experienced a history of conflict. Uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, because of uh, complexities in the region in the 1990s that led to conflict, especially in the eastern part of the country, continues to suffer uh, ongoing conflict, especially in the eastern part of the country. Uh, they have the highest number of internally displaced people in, uh, in the world, uh, people coming from neighboring countries as well as refugees. And the United Nations has, have, has had peacekeepers on the ground in the DRC for 20 years. The Central African Republic, uh, again, uh, both countries, a lot of the conflict currently can be traced back to historical, uh, the era of colonization. And that's certainly true with the Central African Republic. It's often been described as a classic example of a failed state. And um, they have had uh, ongoing conflict. There was a brief period of peace, and then uh, more conflict uh, uh, emerged about six or seven years ago. And while they did recently elect a democratic government, uh, the government actually is only in control of about 40% of the territory. And so uh, both of these countries, uh, uh, the interaction with, uh, with conflict and resources is quite uh, dramatic. So Africa as a continent is considered to be very vulnerable to climate change. And that's for a number of reasons. Africa will experience, uh, scientists tell us, uh, higher than the global average, degree, uh, global average degree of change in climate. People, in, for the most part in Africa, are very dependent on natural resources for their livelihood, whether that's through agriculture, often which is rain-fed agriculture. Certainly in the Central African Republic, over 90% of the people uh, practice agriculture that depends on the, the blessing of, of the rain. People also depend on forests and the goods and services that forests provide. Africa is also considered broadly to have a low degree of adaptive capacity and the determinants of adapt adaptive capacity like inf information, uh, good infrastructure, technology, and governance institutions. And of course, as I already mentioned, many countries in Africa are experiencing conflict and political instability. So some of the predicted impacts of climate change globally, changing uh, precipitation uh, patterns, the rains are not coming when you expect them. And so this is very problematic. As I said, when you're dependent on rain-fed agriculture, you can have scarcity of water. You can have prolonged drought. Um, the frequency and the extremes of weather and climactic events are expected to intensify. And then there also are changing disease patterns, not only for humans, but also for for, uh, uh, for agriculture, whether it's uh, animal husbandry or cropping systems. So when we think about people's, the interactions between climate change and people's ability to adapt in conflict-affected areas, we can easily imagine some of those um, expected interactions. And so I'm going to name a few of them. This list is certainly not exhaustive. But when people live in fear and they're forced to flee their, flee their homes because of uh, conflict, they're not able to pursue their livelihood as they're expected, they're not able to send their children to school, they're not able to market any goods, they basically can't have a normal life. And so their livelihoods are generally then very restricted. And so, so any climate related extreme event can of course only exacerbate that uh, suffering. And if it persists to such a degree that the people actually have to leave where they live and maybe even flee to another country, then they may live in refugee camps and where their lives are completely disrupted and they become dependent on aid organizations 
or try to eke out a living to feed their families in any way they can. And additionally, when you have the congregation of people in refugee camps, as there has been, as there was in the, in the Eastern DRC for, for uh, you know, at least a decade, you also have a big impact on the natural environment, especially people cutting trees for firewood. And so that uh, the refugee camps from, following the genocide in Rwanda in the East, that, ha that came into Eastern DRC had a really uh, uh, significant impact on the environment on that area. And so when people also, to try to make a living, start trying to plant some crops in areas maybe where they shouldn't be planting crops because it's too steep, that can also lead to challenges. Where there's drought and streams dry up, water becomes limiting, so it's further to walk to get water. And so, of course, this exacerbates people's suffering. Also, if you're planting on steeply sloped uh, areas, then the soil, and with more intense rain events, can, uh, you know, can wash away the soil. It has another effect as well. Uh, Conflict can directly destroy infrastructure that perhaps is helping with development. Uh, when I was doing some research in the Central African Republic, uh, I was told by that the meteorology department and the agriculture department with funding from UNDP were putting together weather stations throughout the country which was intended to provide information on climate and weather to local farmers. And, uh, but because of the conflict, that, of course, had all been destroyed in the conflict. The infrastructure was gone, and so, you know, that has that impact as well. Uh, another direct result of, uh, clim of uh, conflict and climate change is that international organizations may not be able to respond to natural disasters or really continue any health or development program that, were, that was underway prior to the conflict. And in, especially in the Central African Republic, some uh, international aid organizations and even the UNHCR had to withdraw because of direct attacks on, on their infrastructure and their staff. And so this means that there's very few actors or even international actors to respond to the needs of displaced people. Um, this can, when international actors are not able to be there, that also has an impact on even a feeling of security that people have. And the government, when the government is focused on fighting rebel groups, um, they're not focused on the needs of their people either. So if there is some, you know, uh, maybe a prolonged drought and maybe people do not have seed stock to plant for another year, the government isn't even well placed with resources to even provide uh, seed for people. So, so there's a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, interactions. Some of the more direct ways that we can see conflict having an impact um, is also more indirect. So the, in some research done in Gaza, looking at the interaction between conflict and social vulnerability and climate change, they found what they called conflict-structured non-climactic risks. And these, non, these uh, conflict structured non-climactic risks was actually, actually leading to increased risks from climate change. And the idea is, is that, uh, you know, when people have to focus so much on getting through from one day to the other, there's no way that they can develop this long-term uh, capacity to adapt in, in going into the future. They're just focused on coping from day to day. And so they have a capacity to cope day to day, but they're not able to uh, develop that long-term adaptive capacity. And so therefore, they're less resilient when facing the challenges of environmental change. So this enforced coping also happens at the national and local level in governance. So obviously, in these fragile states, there's often a historic uh, vacuum in governance, very weak institutions. And so when there is conflict, the government, as I said, is often, for, is often focused on fi fi fighting the conflict, not on you know, rural development, not on poverty reduction strategies that would actually foster the resilience of, the, of a country to climate change. Uh, for example, the international community has been working through national adaptation uh, programs of action. Uh, and for example, in the Central African Republic, there's significant funding to, uh, that's been approved to help invest uh, in CAR, 
but how can they really effectively implement these programs when the government is only in control of 40% of the country and there's, there's this ongoing conflict within, you know, within the country. And so another, another uh, indirect effect related to uh, uh, conflict and climate change is that when you have in conflict areas in fragile states, you typically have a high turnover of people who are involved in governance. So there's not really a lot of stability in governing institutions as weak as they might be. And so they're not able to store knowledge, they're not able to store resilience, which would help with planning and thinking in the long term about how to respond to climate change. There's very little institutional memory and often a lack of, of skills. And so this high turnover is also, is also a challenge. In our research in Central Africa, I was very much focused on Red Plus, uh, which I, I'm sure you know about, but it's uh, a policy that, or a mechanism that's designed to address uh, and help mitigate climate change by providing investment for countries in the developing world to keep their forests intact or to invest in more sustainable approaches uh, to forest management. And so there's a number of uh, of international institutions like the World Bank, the Forest Investment Program, other, other countries coming together, the Central African Forest Initiative that are uh, providing uh, resources, funding, trying to build capacity in countries to be able to effect effectively implement Red Plus. But how can you put in place long-term monitoring of forested areas uh, and ensuring that they may, uh, remain intact when there's been little historical investment in an educational system or in infrastructure, is, a basic infrastructure is lacking and there's a lack of people with the skills to even be involved. And so when the rule of law is tenuous at best, how can uh, anyone in the country or even internationally be certain that what's been agreed upon is going to actually be implemented? So if lo and also if local people are supposed to be paid for you know, keeping the forest intact and uh, protecting it, what guarantee is there in a conflict-affected country to actually be able to know they're going to get some benefit for it? So how can these fragile states that are suffering from this history of conflict and weak governance really be able to participate in these international initiatives? Now, in many countries, there are weak national governance institutions, but oftentimes at the local level, there are a lot of local institutions that are in place, and these local institutions are really a source of resilience for the population. I'm going to be talking more about that uh, this afternoon in some of my research in Cameroon. And so these have been, uh, uh, groups have been shown to really be able to help people adapt to climate change. So, but the question is, when you're in a fragile state, when you're in a conflict situation, um, some of those linkages have been destroyed or they don't exist anymore. So if there has been, uh, uh, these, these groups work well when people trust each other and, and work well together. And if the bonds of trust have been destroyed because of inter-ethnic conflict, has, which has happened in uh, DRC and the Central African Republic, how is that trust going to be restored? It would take a very long time. And without these bonds of recipro reciprocity, uh, sharing, learning together, that makes people even more vulnerable to climate change. So, so far, this has really been a very negative <laughs> talk, and you're all probably really depressed at this point in time, as I've recited all of these challenges in conflict-affected countries. Um, but I do think that there's a potential uh, in a, trying to address climate change uh, to, in these post-conflict situations. Obviously, if there's open conflict, that is difficult. Uh, but in a post-conflict situation, I think there are opportunities to try to build uh, long-term capacity to adapt to climate change, because that, I feel, can go hand in hand with peace building. So there may be opportunities to try to link efforts in reconstruction, in reconciliation, in peace building 
uh, as a country tries to move forward, as communities try to move forward in a post-conflict era. I'm not saying that it's easy. I'm, I don't have a Pollyanna view of the world, but I do think that there are opportunities for, uh, for investment, for intervention uh, to move forward. Uh, but typically, of course, you know, the peacekeeping or peace building, such as UN peacekeepers might be involved in, has been very separate. It's on a separate tract than uh, climate change, uh, uh, you know, interventions and uh, funding through, through uh, the international institutions. But as part of the international processes on climate change, I think it would be important for those in government, for NGOs, uh, for other groups, um, to come together because there's a requirement that, uh, that countries uh, participate in planning for long-term climate change. And so it presents an opportunity to try to bring together diverse uh, groups of people and maybe in the process of trying to think down the road and how do we actually address some of these uh, current and future challenges of climate change, um, it could be an opportunity to try to bring the focus to something different rather than the uh, the things that have led to the conflict. Now this of course is not easy because oftentimes in fragile states uh, certain groups are excluded and uh, certainly that has been the case in Central African Republic when they have moved into situations of relative peace, uh, you know, groups that have been deliberately excluded by those who might be in power because maybe they were hostile uh, to the regime in the first place. But at the local level there actually has been some some initiatives and some research that have been done where some development organizations have had some success in bringing together previously hostile groups to focus on climate change and how to address climate change and development concerns in general. And so they've found that by having these structured interventions that build on the common ground of people's livelihoods, that helps to build bridges uh, between groups that are often in, in conflict. Um, Matthews in his paper uh, in 2014, he talks about this, that perhaps the biggest challenge going forward for the next few decades is of course climate change, but also how do we bring pe uh, those, the peace building and the climate change communities together. Post-conflict societies are perhaps the most fragile societies on the planet and trying to assist them while ignoring the insights of climate ch science would be irresponsible and dangerous. So, you know, we have the same international institutions. I mean, the UN, of course, is an umbrella organization for many of these initiatives, but there's also many international institutions uh, and countries that fund uh, peace building initiatives but, and climate change initiatives, but they don't necessarily bring the two of them together. Now, we all know international institutions are not known for being very nimble uh, or self-reflective in being able to uh, uh, approach things in a new way. But I think it's, uh, I think it's important that, that climate change become a cross-cutting issue uh, in all development and peace-building uh, peace operations. And certainly, uh, in some of our research, those who have been involved in, for example, uh, trying to put red plus mechanisms in place in the DRC saw their interventions as also been a way to improve governance in the country as well. So uh, Vivekananda in their paper published in Development and Practice, they talk about the double dividend of resilience to conflict and climate change that we can only actually achieve that if we take into account the contextual complexities. And, uh, this has been shown, for example, in uh, Liberia, in Sierra Leone, where in post-conflict situations, uh, because natural resources were uh, a key part of in helping to fuel the conflict in both those countries, that therefore natural resources needed to be a focus of, uh, of the country going forward. Uh, however, and whereas both countries have certainly made strides, um, there, there wasn't really a recognition of the complexity and of the context uh, to really be able to uh, try to uh, integrate uh, the, the governance of the natural resources, forests in Liberia, uh, diamonds in uh, Sierra Leone, uh, into, into the governance of the country going forward. So to go back to Vivekananda's quote, that if we actually want to change systems, then we need to actually set out to do it. And so, uh, 
even though institutions are not necessarily nimble, uh, they, there is a need to overcome the skepticism um, and the complacency that is there. And so for the climate change community, this may mean that they need to be sensitive to the nature and the context of the conflict and try to build processes of conflict resolution and conflict prevention into their adaptation programs. And for the peace building and the development communities, it means that they have to ensure that conflict mitigation and development efforts take into account the reality of climate change. And so to do this would require some far-reaching structural change. In most recently, for example, in uh, like a poverty reduction strategy paper and some of the post-conflict interventions that the World Bank is trying to do in the Central African Republic, there is some discussion of, of the need to uh, address uh, climate change and they sometimes see red plus as one of those opportunities for economic development to help the country going forward. So trying to integrate climate change mitigation and adaptation into it. So there is, is maybe some change uh, happening. But it's, you know, for the climate, the, develop, the climate development, peace, uh, peace building and government actors, uh, you know, donors, NGOs, governments, practitioners, uh, there's a lot of bureaucratic hurdles that need to be overcome a lot of institutional barriers that need to be overcome in order to be able to, uh, to work across these different uh, silos uh, that uh, these institutions have operated in. But I think just given the nature of our world going forward, uh, whether or not there is a, a direct connection between uh, you know, whether climate change is causing conflict, the reality is that many countries in the world are mired in conflict and they are already experiencing climate change. So then how do we move forward uh, trying to address the peace building aspect as well as uh, the development aspect as well as the uh, ad adaptation to climate change aspect as well. So thank you very much uh, for your attention and uh, for the opportunity to present this seminar. <clears throat> Twelve minutes or so for questions. So, uh, Carolyn, you can call in people. Uh, sure. Okay. Yes. Obviously, you made a good case that the conflict itself creates a lot of instability and you know, ability to respond to anything. Yeah. Um, how hopeful are you that twenty years from now or twenty fifty, you're going to see what what Japan's dreams are? Oh. <laughs> Well, I guess it depends on which day of the week it is. Um, how hopeful am I? Yeah, some days not very hopeful because I think we, as, uh, you know, even as a global community, you know, not a lot of countries are stepping up to the challenge to even try to, you know, try to address their, their uh, you know, global emission reduction targets. Certainly Canada is not on track to do that. Um, and so I think, I think there's... Uh, on some days I, I'm not hopeful in that regard. But I do think that, uh, for example, as I was mentioning, uh, some of the recent documents I'm reading from the World Bank, where they, they are, it seems, for example, in Central African Republic, and probably just because of the protracted nature of, of, uh, of the country and the conflict that has gone on for so long, um, and how to actually move forward on that, I, I do see some some recognition of the need to address some of those changes along with uh, you know their uh, you know what they see as their avenues for economic development and, and reconstruction in a post-conflict society so on the other end from the um, from the UN peacekeeping or peace building side I'm not seeing uh, I'm not an expert in this area as I said you know this is something that's came out of more of a personal interest but in the literature there there doesn't seem to be any uh, uh, perspective to address that on the peace building side right now. So, yes? Um, you mentioned in your talk that local institutions on the ground seem to be uh, more resilient than some of their more national or regional counterparts. I won't be able to make it to your discussion later this afternoon. I'm sorry, I have a class. Yeah, I was supposed to present it yesterday. Yeah, so. yeah. yeah. Um, is it women's groups, or are we talking municipal governments, religious mm -hmm. institutions? Like, what is mm -hmm. the nature of these local institutions? Right. How are they operating? Yeah. 
do you think they are the most successful mm -hmm. intervention? And how do you see them <coughs> collaborating with larger institutions or entities moving forward? Um, I think that uh, it isn't just women's groups. I mean, I had that picture of, uh, you know, traditional savings and loan group, which is, you know, certainly very common in Africa and, you know, in probably other parts of the world. Um, these local institutions, which exist in a lot of communities, I see them as, a, as an asset that's there that you can, can build upon. And so, therefore, they're a source of resilience. Uh, if you, th you think about uh, a savings and loan group right now may be operating in the sense that to provide for emergencies that happen in people's personal lives, whether it's a health crisis or a, uh, you know, a death in the family, but those are also pooled resources that can respond if there is a drought and people have, uh, you know, don't have you know, seeds to plant for the next planting cycle, those sorts of things, or to tide people over into, uh, you know, when the rains come again. So certainly there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, ties to helping a community be resilient and, you know, adaptation really happens at the local level. But that being said, also knowledge from outside, whether it's local agencies of government that intervene in a community like uh, extension agents in agriculture or those sorts of things, or, or, or for the government at the national level to be not just talking about climate change, but actually reaching down to the local level, uh, you know, those definitely build resilience. And unfortunately in Red Plus, in, at least in my research, there has been a, a lot of disconnect between a lot of discussions that happen at the national level and don't really make much difference at the local level. So, yes? Uh, um, based off the last thing you said right there, in regards to Red Plus, do you see any sort of like local community pushback against that? Because I know in parts of South America, um, there's like arguments at the local level that it's like another form of colonization. Um, is there a similar type of dynamic? Um, well, I, ha I haven't, uh, Joanne might be a well placed to talk about that in uh, some of her, her research that she did in DRC at the local level. Um, I, I'm not familiar with everywheres in the world, but certainly in my reading is that yes, it's often, it, with any of these types of interventions, it's often is seen as a form of neo-colonialism, right? And so, and also communities wonder, uh, you know, so if I change the way I'm doing things and alter the way I'm using the natural resources that have traditionally been ones that I've used for generations, you know, what, what is there in terms of helping me to compensate me for maybe loss of livelihood? I think there's a lot of, a lot of uh, questions about, about that in Red Plus. Um, there's a question at the back. Uh, yes, so I actually wanted to um, build off the Red Plus question, and I'm thinking about <coughs> kind of in your experience, um, what examples might you provide with regards to kind of in increasing those institutional linkages between like kind of traditional practices, what's happening on the ground at the community level, and then, you know, at the very top, particularly at the national level. So thinking about designing like action plans, national action plans, uh, to go along with the Red Plus strategy. Um, in my research, you know, I've, I've learned that there are incredible gaps between sort of that, and it's a very top-down approach, yep. so I'm wondering if yep. you have some successful or model uh, examples in which the bottom-up kind of approach has worked, particularly in creating a national, national action plan. Um, I, I don't, because I don't specifically do our research in that area to know of specific models that, you know, that would be good examples. I think there's, unfortunately, uh, with, you know, with Red Plus, there is a lot of disconnect. And even with, like, NAPAs, there is a lot of discussion at the national level, very little at the, at the local level. And so a lot of this is very top-down driven, and that, of course, is not uncommon with like large uh, international institutions that are intervening in countries. Um, it's not really something that's coming from the bottom up. And so yeah, that, that's a challenge. And unfortunately, I'm sorry, I can't really give you any uh, models. Uh. Yeah, do you see in those countries a difference Well, I, I mean, that's a good question uh, because I think, I think that uh, I mean, develop, development always requires some form of adaptation, uh, you know, to new circumstances. And I think with, with climate change and recognizing the, uh, 
the impact climate change is going to have on any type of development, whether it's agricultural development or uh, you know, water development, I think, I think you need to take into account those two aspects. So I think uh, you know, helping uh, a country to develop and adapt to climate change at the same time, I think they're very much together. Not just in the sense that, as I was said, some of the Red Plus funding is to help countries, you know, with low carbon uh, approaches to development, as opposed to the one that was taken by, for example, North America. That certainly has been part of Red Plus. Uh, but I think even if you're at the local level and you're a local NGO that's trying to help communities improve their livelihoods and do things uh, in a more sustainable way that's better off for the environment and for people, I think climate change is just a cross-cutting issue that should be part of it. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>